Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 1. Which of the following is a talophyte? A. Fine. B. Liverwort. C. Moss. D. Mold. And D. E. Vovox. Now, talophyte is a division. Talophyte is a division under Kingdom Plantae. Under Kingdom Plantae, based on classification. Now, talophyte, also known as algae, also known as algae, have what they have. They are simple green plants. They are simple green plants that are all aquatic. They are all aquatic. So they are simple what green plants. Are. You can call them what simple aquatic green plants. Now they are usually what they usually have thread like. Or you call it filamentous or flat bodies that these plants now that lack what vascular bundles so that means the talophytes do not have stem they lack vascular bundles they do not have stem they do not have roots they lack vascular bundles examples are examples of talophytes include we have the spirogera the spirogera is an example and also the volvox is an example of what of talophytes they are what they are algae now option a here says fern now fern is not a talophyte fern is a what is a pteridophyte fern is a pteridophyte because it has vascular bundles liverwort and moss are bryophytes also under kingdom plantae now mold is a fungi under kingdom fungi and then E, Vovox, is the answer to this question because Vovox is a what is a talophyte. So this is the correct answer to this question. Vovox. And share subscribe to our channel for more videos. Thank you. Good day and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass Question 2. Plants store f excess food in the form of A. Cellulose B. Glucose C. Glycogen D. Starch and E. Sucrose Now, plants, like we know, plants manufacture their food Plants manufacture their food That is, they produce their own food So, plants manufacture their food And they do this by using what? They do this by using water chlorophyll chlorophyll presence in chloroplast and sunlight so those are the three main factors required for what for production of plant food and this process is what we call photosynthesis so the process by which plants manufacture their food with the help of water chlorophyll and sunlight is known as photosynthesis now when photosynthesis occur plants manufacture their food in form of glucose and the byproduct of photosynthesis is what oxygen but this is the main thing here the glucose is the main thing now plants manufacture their food in form of glucose but now this glucose when stored in the plant body like and it is mostly stored in the plant leaves when stored they are stored in form of what starch remember glucose is a monosaccharide but starch is a polysaccharide so therefore plants food are actually stored in what in starch form which is a polysaccharide and that is option D. Now glycogen is stored in animals, not plants. Glycogen is stored in animals, so it is not correct. And glucose is the word food produced. But they say the food was stored, that is plant stores excess food in the form of starch. So starch is the correct answer to this question, which is option D. Thank you and God bless you. And subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 3. The largest phylum in the animal kingdom is A. Annelida, B. Arthropoda, C. Caudata, D. Mollusca, and E. Prolifera. Now, the animal kingdom, also known as the Kingdom Animalia, the Kingdom Animalia, 
is actually composed of eight phylums. It's made up of eight phylums, ranging from your phylum Porifera, the Colenterata, the Echinodermata, the phylum Arthropoda, your Anelida, phylum Mollusca, Caudata, and so on. Now, out of this eight phylum, the largest of this phylum is the phylum Anelida. I'm um, Arthropoda, sorry. You know, the Anelida is for the earthworm. So, the phylum Arthropoda is the largest phylum in the animal kingdom. And this is because the phylum Arthropoda is composed of the insects, the class Insecta, it's composed of the crustaceans, the crustaceans and the arachnids that's class arachnida the arachnids and also the myopoda that is the myopus comprising comprising of the what the centipede and the millipedes now you agree with me that the arthropods or the this class and phylum arthropoda making up of insects with the largest because in a population the insects are always what the species with the largest population now them falling under the phylum arthropoda together with the crustaceans the arachnids which are the spiders and the myopods which compose of the centipede and the millipede has made what the phylum arthropoda the largest phylum in the animal kingdom and that is why what option b is correct because option b says arthropoda so phylum arthropoda is the largest phylum in the animal kingdom it is larger than any other phylum it is even larger than the phylum codata which is made up of what vertebral animals that is animals with backbone so it is actually what the largest phylum in the animal kingdom thank you and make sure you subscribe to our channel to get more videos and past questions hello good day and welcome i'll be answering neko 2019 biology past question 4 Corals belong to the phylum A. Anelida, B. Colenterata, C. Mollusca, D. Platyhelminthes, and E. Porifera. Now, coral is an animal. Coral is an animal. And they are usually called the coral polyp. Now, coral belongs to a phylum under Kingdom Animalia. It belongs to phylum under kingdom animalia and this phylum is the phylum colenterata phylum colenterata colenterata or what we call phylum nideria so along with the hydra and sea anim animals and jellyfish so along with hydra jellyfish and coral they are all what phylum colenterata now they are phylum colenterata because they have what they have specialized cells and tissues they have specialized cells cells and tissues and are radially they are radially what symmetrical that means they can be divided into two equal half from any plane they are radially symmetrical so corals belong to the phylum what colenterata and that is option b along with hydra jellyfish and sea anemones so they are radially what symmetrical meaning they can be divided into two equal half from any plane so the answer is option b colenterata now the phylum Anelida is made up of the roundworms. The mollusca is made up of those with shells like the snail. The platyhelminthes is the flatworm, like a tapeworm. The flatworm. And the porifera are sponges, which exist in what in colonies, but colenterata do not exist in colonies, so they are not sponges. Did not exist in what in colonies, and so corals belong to what colenterata. Thank you and God bless you. And should subscribe to our channel for more videos.
Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 5. Use the diagram below to answer question 5. Now, this is the diagram given to us. This is the diagram, and this diagram is a diagram representing what? An open stoma, or you can call it a stomata. Yes, it's still correct, an open stoma, because this is a stomata pore, and look at it, it's an open stoma. Now, the question says what? We should use this diagram to answer this question and the question says the part labeled 3 is the now this is the part labeled 3 let's trace it this is the part labeled 3 so is the what a says cellular cell wall b says chloroplast c says guard cell this is nucleus and e says stoma like i said i said this is diagram illustrate what an open stoma or open stomata and like we know this open stomata or a stomata or stoma regulates it regulates the exchange of gases in plants. Regulates the exchange of gases in plants. When it's open, when it opens, what gases are even exchanged, and when it closes, no gas is what is exchanged. So this is an open stoma because the stomata pore is open. Now to know what this III represents, we have to what label this diagram. Now, labeling this diagram, I represents the chloroplast. I represents the chloroplast. This is it. These are the chloroplasts. I I represents the outer thin wall. The outer thin wall. So this is I I representing what the outer thin wall. Look at it. Now, I I I, which is three, represents the nucleus. It represents the nucleus, and this is it. And this is the question we are asked for that the past labeled III is known as the nucleus. Now, IV, IV is the guard cell. IV are the guard cell. These are the cells that regulate what the opening and closing of the stomata. They are specialized cells. They regulate the opening and closing of the stomata. Then V is the word stomata pore. V is a stomata pore, and that is why we say what is an open stomata because the pore is open. The stomata pore. But the question says the part labeled 3 III is the nucleus. The nucleus. So option D is the correct answer. The nucleus. Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 6. Use the diagram below to answer Question 6. Now, this is the diagram given to us, and this diagram represents an open stomata or open stoma. And like we know, it regulates what's the exchange of gases in plants. Now, the part that allows passage of water vapor to the atmosphere is the part that allows passage of water vapor to the atmosphere is. Now, let's label this part fully so we can know the parts. I says. I is the chloroplast. I is the chloroplast. I I is the outer thin wall. The outer thin wall. I I I is the nucleus. I V is the guard cell. And V is the stomata pore. Now this is the part that allows passage of water vapor to the atmosphere is. Now, the chloroplast, like we know, contains the chlorophyll that is responsible for what photosynthesis. So, it cannot be what we are looking for. It cannot be what we are looking for. Now, I I is the outer thin wall that helps to protect the stoma. So, it can't be this. Then, I I I is the nucleus which regulates what activity is going on in the stoma. So, it can't be this. Now, option f um, I V says what the guard cell. Now, the guard cells are responsible for what. They control the opening and closing of this stomata. They control the opening and closing of the stomata of the stomata. They control the opening and closing of the stomata. I can see the stomata now. This stomata is what is an open stoma. The stomata pore is open. Now this is the guard cell. These are the guard cells, and these guard cells what they control the opening and closing of this what stomata. But then the question says the part that allows the passage of water vapor. 
Now, V here is the stomatal pore. It is this stomatal pore that allows the passage. Stomatal pore. It is this stomatal pore that allows the passage. It allows the passage of gases. Although the guard cell regulates the opening and closing of the stomata pore, but still the stomata pore is done that has the function of what allowing the passage of the water vapor to the atmosphere. Like you know, water vapor is a gas. So therefore, V is the correct answer, and that is option E. Stomata pore. V is the stomatal pore that allows the passage of what all gas of gases, ex respiratory gases, including the what the water vapor. So V is the correct answer. Thank you and God bless you. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos and for more past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Past Question 7. Burette test is performed to show the presence of A. Fats, B. Protein, C. Starch, D. Sugar, and E. Vitamin. Now, Burette test is actually a chemical test that is used to detect. Burette test is a chemical test used to detect the presence of. It is used to detect the presence of peptide bonds. It is used to detect the presence of peptide bonds. That's a Burette test. Now, in the presence of this peptide bond, a violet sort color, a violet color, is actually produced. A violet color is produced due to the presence of due to the presence of an alkaline copper sulfate. So, this alkaline copper sulfate, which is a component of the Burette test, when it reacts with the peptide bond, coming across a peptide bond, it's what it gives out this violet color. And that is why we say Burette test is a test that is used to what is used to show the presence of peptide bond. Now, out of this option, the only option here that comprises of peptide bonds is protein, which is option B. Proteins are um made up of proteins are made up of amino acids amino acids which are bonded together by peptide bond they are bonded together by peptide bond so this peptide bond is a bond that exists between what amino acids and protein here is are made up of what are made up of amino acids which are bound together by what peptide bond. So therefore, Burette test is used to is a test that is performed to show the presence of what of proteins, which is option B, proteins, and that will give us what a violet color. Thank you and God bless you. And sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I'll be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 8. The color that indicates the presence of starch in a food test is A. Blue, black, B. Brown, C. Pink, D. Red, and E. Yellow. Now, to test for starch in a food, we use the iodine starch test. The iodine starch test is used to test for what starch in a food, and this is done by what combining. Is a chemical reaction involving the combination of starch and iodine. Now, when you combine starch and iodine, there will be a what resulting blue black coloration. So, a blue black color will be seen. And this is a test for what for starch. It's, it approves that what starch is present in that food. So the answer to this question is option A. Blue black is the color that indicates the presence of starch in a food when the iodine starch test is used. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to our channel for more videos.
good day and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass question, question 9. The study of only one species of organism in relation to its environment is termed A. Otecology, B. Biogeography, C. Biology, D. Ecology, and E. Sane Ecology. Now, the study of one species of organism is what is asked here in relation to its environment, which is known as ecology is the study ecology is the study of organisms in relation to their environment in relation to their environment and now this is what ecology now ecology is divided into two basically the synecology and the autoecology and the synecology here deals with the study of the interaction study of interaction between natural communities between natural communities and their environment and their environment and like we know natural communities is made up of what many populations so many population make up a community and so at ecology here on the other hand is defined as a study of one species one species that is a population study of one species of organism in relation to its environment in relation to its environment now this is what autoecology so autoecology is actually the answer to this question because it involves this word study of only one species of organism in relation to its environment but in ecology here which is a branch of ecology this is the study of for different communities that is various species of organisms so the answer to this question is option a autoecology now biology here is simply the study of what life the study of life is biology here so the answer to this question is what option a what's ecology thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel to get more of our videos and past questions hello good day and welcome i will be answering neko 2019 biology pass question 10. the following are biotic factors except a disposal B. Humidity, C. Natality, D. Parasitism, and E. Predation. Biotic factors are the living components of an ecosystem. They are the living parts or components of an ecosystem or in an ecosystem. And like you know, the ecosystem is made up of the biotic factors. The biotic factors involving the words, the plants and animals and everything what associated with them involving plants and animals and the activities and the abiotic factor which is the words, the non-living components such as temperature sunlight climate topography humidity now all these are what humidity all these are abiotic factors and so on now the question says the following abiotic factors except a here says dispersal dispersal involves what plants and animals that is dispersal movement from one place to another it involves plants and animals so it's what it is a biotic factor now natality simply means death it's also a what it's also but it's also a what a biotic factor because it involves what plants and animals parasitism too is also a factor that involves plants and animals that's parasites parasites are what animals so parasitism is a biotic factor likewise predation predation is also a biotic factor because it involves what animals but now humidity here is an abiotic factor because it's not a living what component all this now are associated with what with the living components but this natality um, humidity here humidity 
is not what it's not associated with the living component it's a non-living component of the what of the ecosystem so therefore it is the answer to this question because the question says biotic factors except so the answer is humidity humidity is the right answer to this question thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to the channel for more videos In Neko 2019, biology past question, question 11. The instrument used for measuring turbidity of water is A. Anemometer, B. Barometer, C. Hydrometer, D. Photometer, and E. Circuit Now, turbidity, like we know, is one of the abiotic factors of the ecosystem, and turbidity is caused. Turbidity is caused by the presence of suspended matter. By the presence of suspended matter. In water. Now, turbidity prevents the penetration of light into the water, and so it affects the activities of photosynthetic organisms. And so, we refer to as turbidity as part of the ecosystem because it's an abiotic factor that also affects the, the biotic components of the ecosystem because it affects the photosynthetic organism because it prevents what light from penetrating into the water. Now, turbidity is actually measured using the circuit the circuit disc is used to measure turbidity. Now, this is done by what? By putting the circuit disc. The circuit disc is usually white. Now, by lowering the circuit disc into the water, by lowering the disc into the water, by lowering this disc into the water, and noting the depth at which this disc is no longer visible, and noting the depth. At which it is no longer visible. It is no longer visible. The turbidity can be estimated. The turbidity of the water can be estimated. So therefore, circuit disc is what is used towards to measure turbidity. Now, anemometer here, which is option A, is actually used to measure the speed of wind. Speed of wind. That's wind speed. Barometer is used to measure pressure. Hydrometer is used to measure relative density and photometer is used to measure light intensity. Light intensity. But circuit disc option E is used to measure turbidity. Thank you and just subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass question, question 12. Organisms that produces their own food are called A. Autotrophs, B. Carnivores, C. Herbivores, D. Heterotrophs, and E. Omnivores. Now, I asked to pick an option which is described as animals or organisms that produce their own food. Now, option A here says autotrophs. Now, this word autotroph simply means what? Organisms. Autotrophs are organisms that produces their own food. That produces their own food. We call this organism what autotrophs because they have the ability to produce their own food. And these organisms are actually what? They are plants. They are green plants. They are green plants. They use sunlight, water and chlorophyll to produce their food in the presence in through a process known as what? photosynthesis and that is why we say what they are autotrophs because they have the ability to produce their own food through a process known as photosynthesis now option b here says carnivores carnivores are simply organisms that feed on flesh or animals organisms that feed on flesh example is the lion tigers leopard and the rest now c option c says herbivores herbivores are organisms Herbivores are herbivores are organisms that feed on plant materials. They feed on plant materials. Example is the cattle, goats, sheep, and so on. Now the heterotrophs. Heterotrophs now are organisms. 
heterotrophs are organism that depends on the autotrophs which are the plants so they depend on the autotrophs which are plants for food so therefore the heterotrophs are organisms that cannot produce their own food they depends on the autotrophs or the plants for their food now omnivores which is option e simply refers to organisms that feed on both plants and animals organisms that feeds on both plants and animals and a typical example of omnivores is human or man so therefore from this explanation that i've just given you agree with me that the answer to this question is option a autotrophs because autotrophs are simply organisms that has the ability to produce their own foods through a process known as photosynthesis and i say these organisms are actually what green plants so the answer to this question is option a autotrophs Thank you and God bless you and should subscribe to the channel for more videos and for more past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Past Question 13. The association between man and tapeworm is A. Commensalism B. Mutualism C. Parasitism, D. Predation, and E. Saprophytism. So we are asked for the words really association between man and tapeworm. Now, brief, let's just let's briefly describe the association between man and tapeworm. Now, like we know, tapeworm are flatworms. They belong to the phylum Platyelminthes. So they are flatworm. Tapeworm are flatworm, and these tapeworm are actually what they live in the intestine of man they live in the intestine of man and now their activities in the gods or the intestine of man is that they would they consume or they feed on they feed on the digested food they feed on the digested food present in the intestine present in the intestine now, as they feed on this digested food present in the intestine, they take away all the nutritive substances and thereby cause all sorts of anemia in man. They take away all nutritive substances, nutritive substances, and thereby cause what? Cause anemia. They cause anemia in man. Now you see that what the activities of this tapeworm in man is actually what's harmful because they live in the intestine that is in the gut of man, feed on the digested food which is supposed to be what's used by the man, take away all the nutritive substances, and causes what anemia. They also cause what vomiting in severe cases and even irritates the walls of the intestine. Now you see that these activities are what actually harmful on man, that the activities of tapeworm are harmful on man, and tapeworm actually what live in man. Now let's describe the options. Option A says commensalism. Now commensalism is a type of association whereby one of the organisms known as the commensal, the commensal actually what the commensal benefits from this association, the commensal benefits, but the other organism neither what neither benefits nor harmed. That is the the other organism is referred to as a neutral organism. And the other organism is referred to as what as a neutral organism. It is neither what benefited nor harm from this association. An example can be seen in shark and remora fish. You can see this in shark and remora fish. Now, option B says mutualism. In mutualism, in mutualism, both organisms involved actually what gain. That is both organisms involved in mutualism this association they benefit from each other they benefit from each other they benefit from each other and an example of mutualism is what you see in cattle and tick beds 
cactus and tick beds. Now, the tick beds feeds on the tick beds feeds on the cat on the um, ticks on the body of the cattle, and also the cattle benefits by what by the ticks being taken away from their body, so that making them free from ticks. Now, C says parasitism. Now, parasitism is a type of association whereby an organism known as the parasite, an organism known as the parasite, lives and feed on the body of the hosts. It lives and feeds on the body of the hosts, and causes what and causes damage to the host. That's what parasitism. Now, option D says predation. In terms of predation, the organism, an organism known as a predator, the predator actually what hunts the prey. It hunts the other organism, what, what you call, call the prey, prey for food. food. An, an example, you will see that in what in lion and its prey, like maybe lion, lion and the antelope. Now, and the lion is the predator because it goes to hunt for its prey, which is the antelope for food. Now, now option E is saprophytism. saprophytism. Now, saprophytism is a type of relationship whereby what the organisms feed on dead what remains they feed on dead remains and vulture usually what practices this saprophytism this type of association now for my description of all these options you will see that what the association between man and tapeworm is parasitism because the tapeworm is what is a parasite that lives and feed it lives inside what the man which is the host that is in the intestine of man Man, man being the host and the tapeworm being the word parasite. Now it's now what it feeds on the host that like is feeding on digested food present in the intestine of the host, which is man, and also what causes damage to man by causing anemia, vomiting, and other words, other sort of diseases. So the association between man and tapeworm is parasitism. Option C. Thank you and God bless you. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello Goody and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 14. Activities prohibited at national parks include the following except A. Game hunting, B. Grazing, C. Hunting, D. Lodging, and E. Mining. Now what are national parks? National parks are simply what? National parks are park. They are park used for the converse conservation of the environment these parks are majorly was created for the conservation of the environment that is for conservation purposes and they are actually created and protected by the government so they are created and protected by the government and that's why we refer to them as national parks like i said they are used for conservation of the environment now activities prohibited in the national parks includes hunting hunting is prohibited lodging like we know lodging simply means deforestation lodging of food has falling down of trees mining is actually what prohibited in national parks also overgrazing is prohibited over grazing likewise game hunting like we know game hunting simply means hunting for animals game hunting is also what's prohibited in national parks now the question says activities prohibited at national parks include the following except actually game hunting is prohibited hunting is prohibited falling of trees is prohibited and mining is also prohibited now option b here says what option b here says grazing now grazing is not prohibited in the national park but over grazing is prohibited so take notes grazing is not prohibited because grazing simply means what animals feeding on grasses and like you know in national parks you find animals and these animals actually feed on grasses that's grazing but now over grazing is prohibited in a national park because a national park actually aims to conserve the environment and over grazing will help to uh, deplete the environment so grazing is actually the answer to this question it is not prohibited in a national park Option B is the correct answer. Thank you and God bless you. And should subscribe to our channel for more videos.
Hello, good day, and welcome. I'll be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 15. A pollutant that causes suffocation and death when combined with hemoglobin is A. Carbon monoxide, B. Carbon dioxide, C. Lead, D. Nitric oxide, and E. Sulfur dioxide. Now, all these are air pollutants. All these are air pollutants. And we are asked that what the air pollutant or a pollutant that causes suffocation and death when combined with hemoglobin is. Now, the answer to this question is actually option E, carbon monoxide, because carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas. Now, carbon monoxide being a poisonous gas, that is CO, will combine, when inhaled, will combine with hemoglobin present in the red blood cell. Let me term the hemoglobin HB in red blood cell. It's combined with hemoglobin in the red blood cell to so form carboxy hemoglobin to form carboxy hemoglobin now this carboxy hemoglobin has no what has no affinity for oxygen it has no affinity for oxygen and like we know oxygen is very important in what in humans because the brain uses consumes, consumes a lot of energy um, oxygen now when this carbon monoxide combined with hemoglobin to form carboxy hemoglobin its affinity for oxygen is decreased and as blood goes to the brain there's what there's lack of oxygen so the brain lacks oxygen and because of this there will be what there will be suffocation the brain will suffer suffocation and when this persists after a long period of time it will lead to what it will lead to death so the answer to this question is what carbon monoxide Carbon monoxide is a very, very poisonous gas. Carbon monoxide. Thank you, and be sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos. Good day and welcome. I'll be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 16. The following are renewable natural resources except A, F, B, coal, C, plants, D, soil, and E, water. Now, what are renewable natural resources? Now, renewable natural resources are those resources, they are those resources that cannot be used up over time. Cannot be used up over time. Now, these natural resources can be recycled they can be recycled so examples include the soil or land the atmosphere or the air forests that includes plants and animals water and wildlife so all these are natural what renewable natural resources because they can be recycled they can't be used up option a which is air is a renewable resources b plant c plant is a renewable resources this soil is also renewable and e water is renewable but option b which is coal is non-renewable it's a renewable energy resource because once used up it cannot be recycled cannot be recycled so therefore it is non-renewable and this is the answer to this question thank you and be sure you subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions hello good day and welcome i will be answering neko 2019 biology pass question 17 housefly carries microorganisms that causes a cholera b leprosy c malaria the tetanus and e tuberculosis now housefly are referred to as vectors they are disease vectors that is they are organisms they are organisms that carry disease causing organisms in other words, they are simply organisms that carry what pathogens. Now, housefly, housefly carries the pathogen or the microorganism. 
microorganism that causes cholera that causes cholera and that is option a so the microorganism that causes cholera is what actually carried by housefly and this is done this is transferred when housefly comes in contact with what with our consumable products when it comes in contact with our consumable products so housefly carries microorganism that causes cholera and that is the answer to this question thank you and ensure you subscribe to the channel for more videos hello good day and welcome i will be answering echo 2019 biology pass question 18 which of the following is not a method of preventing malaria a breeding mosquitoes b clearing bushes around the house c draining of stagnant water d fumigating the environment and e use of mosquito nets now like we know malaria is actually caused by the microorganism is caused by the microorganism carried by the female anopheles mosquito female anopheles mosquito and this microorganism is known as the plasmodium so plasmodium is a microorganism carried by this was mosquito which causes malaria now in order for us to prevent malaria the best thing to do is to what ensure that mosquitoes are eliminated from our environment so to eliminate those mosquitoes from our environment or surrounding so this is the best way to what to prevent malaria now by eliminating mosquitoes from the environment we are carrying out all the procedures or processes involved in what chasing mosquitoes out of our surroundings now option a says breeding mosquito breeding mosquito simply means what cultivating mosquito and cultivating mosquito will not prevent what malaria so breeding of mosquitoes will not prevent malaria because it will only increase its prevalence in our surrounding now option b says clearing bushes around the house yes clearing of bushes around the house will help towards to prevent malaria Draining of stagnant water also prevents malaria because draining of stagnant water will help reduce the stay of its eggs on the stagnant water. Also, fumigating the environment kills the mosquito, and use of mosquito nets will tend to prevent mosquito from getting in contact with the skin. So now, breeding mosquito is not a method of preventing malaria. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass Question 19. The tip of an inoculation loop is heated before use to A. Attract microorganisms, B. Enable easy attachment of microorganisms, C. Help penetrate culture media with ease, D. Make the tip firm, and E. Sterilize the loop. An inoculating loop, an inoculating loop is actually a simple tool. It is a simple tool used by microbiologists used by microbiologists to pick up and transfer a small sample a small sample from a culture of microorganisms from a culture of microorganism. Now, now this is what what an inoculating loop is. Now, now this inoculating loop has a tip, and before an inoculating loop can be used, it has to be what sterilized. It has to be sterilized because it is dipped into the culture solution in order to what, take a sample of this what culture. So before doing that, it has to be sterilized, and sterilizing this tip of inoculating loop involves what application of heat 
application of heat and this is done by passing it over the flames of a Bunsen burner and by so doing it is what it is sterilized so the tip of an inoculating, inoculating loop is actually heated before used to, what, to sterilize the loop option E is the answer to sterilize it thank you and God bless you and just subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 20. The following are groups of microorganisms except A. Algae, B. Bacteria, C. Fungi, D. Nematodes, and E. Protozoa. Now, microorganisms. Microorganisms are microscopic. They refer to as microscopic organisms. That is where the name is being derived from. Microorganisms. In this micro simply means what microscopic, and that is these organisms are too small to be seen with naked eyes. Are too small to be seen with the naked eyes. They are actually seen with us with the use of microscope. Now these microorganisms includes the bacteria. Virus, viruses, fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, nematodes, and the micro algae. Now the options here says option A says algae, B says bacteria, C says fungi, D nematode, and E protozoa. Now from option B to option E. They are all what micro organisms. They are all micro organisms. But for option A, algae, if we are given micro algae, then we are saying micro algae is what is a micro organism. But algae generally are not micro organism. So therefore the best answer to this for this question is actually option A, algae. Thank you and God bless you and should subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question, Question 21. The following are examples of tropic responses except A. Chemotropism, B. Geotropism, C. Hydrotropism. D. Phototropism and E. Sigmotropism. So we are asked what for the examples of tropic responses except. Now a tropic response tropic response occur when parts that is a part of an organism mostly plants Part of an organism, mostly what plants, move in response, move in response to a directional stimuli, to a directional stimulus. Now, unlike the taxis response or the tactic response, in terms of the tactic response, the whole organism, the whole organism moves in response to a directional stimulus that's for tactic response but for a tropic response which is mostly occur in plants those parts of this organism or part of the plants moves in response to this directional stimuli now example of this tropic response includes phototropism phototropism whereby the plant the part of a plant like the shoots of a plant responds towards to light it moves in the direction of the light that's phototropism another example is the geotropism Geotropism. Also, the shoot of plants responds to what responds to gravity. That's geotropism. Those parts of the plants, not the whole plants. Also, hydrotropism, as you can see in the roots of plants. The roots of plants moves in the direction of what of water. That is hydrotropism. Then you have the sigmotropism. Sigmotropism is also what an example of a tropic response, whereby the plant's parts moves in response to touch. You can see this word in tendrils of plants. 
like your yam your yam plant the tendrils of yam plant you see that what it's what it winds around a particular what a particular object just because it's responding to what to touch that is stigmatropism the part of the plant now not the whole organism respond just the parts of this what organism moves in the direction of the directional stimuli now option a here says chemotropism now parts of plants do not respond to chemicals in terms of chemical response the whole the whole organism respond to chemical the whole organism respond to chemical and we call that what chemotaxics chemotaxics is a what is a toxic response because when they write there's a chemical response the whole organism responds to this chemical and that is chemotaxics so there is nothing like what chemotropism and so therefore chemotropism is the answer to this question because it is not a tropic response geotropism Hydrotropism, phototropism, and tropism are all tropic response except chemotropism. So this is the answer to this question. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to our channel to get more of our videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I'll be answering NECO 2019 biology past question 22. Cellular respiration occurs in the A. Centrioles, B. Cytoplasm, C. Mitochondria, D. Nucleus, and E. Ribosome. So cellular respiration occurs in the... Now, what is cellular respiration? Cellular respiration. Now, cellular respiration is a metabolic process in which oxygen... So I say cellular metabol and respiration is a metabolic process in which oxygen is used by cells to produce energy in form of ATP. Like we know, ATP simply means adenosine triphosphate, which is what, which is a unit of energy that is being used up by cells in the body. So cellular respiration simply involves what? Involves the conversion, that is the use of energy to produce what? To produce the use of oxygen to produce energy, which is ATP. Now this cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria of the cell. It occurs in the mitochondria of the cell. And this is because the mitochondria is regarded or that is why mitochondria is regarded as the powerhouse that is why mitochondria is regarded as what powerhouse of a cell because it is in this mitochondria cellular respiration occurs thereby producing energy that is being required by the body or that is being used by the body so cellular respiration occurs in the cytoplasm and that is option c and um, of course in the mitochondria sorry which is option c Centrals here is for cell division. Centrals is for cell division. Then the nucleus, like we know, controls what the cell activities. Controls all cell activities. And the ribosome here is for protein synthesis. Protein synthesis. Then the cytoplasm is like a jelly, what a jelly fluid, whereby all these cell organelles are actually what suspended. But the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and that is where cellular respiration occurs to provide energy for the body. Thank you and God bless you. Ensure to subscribe to the channel to get more of our videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Past Question 23. The mode of nutrition in Spirogyra is A. Halophytic, B. Holophytic, C. Parasitic, D. Photosynthetic, and E. Saprophytic. So the question is the mode of nutrition in Spirogyra. And like we know, Spirogyra, Spirogyra is an algae. Spirogyra is an algae and it has chlorophyll. So Spirogyra has chlorophyll. Now, Spirogyra produces its own food. Spirogyra produces its own food via the process known as photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis using 
sunlight, using sunlight, water, and chlorophyll. Using sunlight, water, and chlorophyll. So, Spirogyra, although it's an algae, but what acts like a green plant. You know, green plants manufacture their food via photosynthesis. Also, Spirogyra manufactures manufacture its own food via what photosynthesis because it contains chlorophyll and it uses this chlorophyll, water, and sunlight to manufacture its own food. So, therefore, the mode of nutrition in Spirogyra is similar to as what photosynthetic quotes, mode of nutrition that is. Spirogyra are autotrophic, they can produce their own food via photosynthesis. So, regard to them as what photosynthetic mode of nutrition. Now, in halophytic mode of nutrition, the organisms actually what feed on carbonic acids, ammonia, and what and nitrates. They feed on what carbonic acids, ammonia, nitrates from substances. That's what this mode of nutrition. Then, for holophytic, this is where what. The plants or the organism feeds on flu fluid like what materials. Fluid like materials. Why for holozoic they feed on what solid materials like in man. But fluid like materials, when the mode of nutrition involves food like mat and fluid like materials, it is said to be what holophytic. Then parasitic mode of nutrition is a type that is exhibited by what a parasite. You know, parasites, they live on the body of their host and feed on the host. We can refer to that as a parasitic mode of nutrition. Then saprophytic mode of nutrition is where what the organism feeds on decayed what materials. Decayed materials. That's what we call saprophytic. But the type exhibited by the spirogyra is photosynthetic. And that is option D. And I'm giving you the reason because it contains chlorophyll. So they use what sunlight, water, and this chlorophyll to manufacture their food. Thank you and God bless you. And should subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 24. The function of ribosome is for A. Excretion, B. Protein synthesis, C. Reproduction, D. Respiration, and E. Secretion of hormones. Now they are asked to find the function of ribosome. And like we know, ribosome, ribosome is a cell organelle. Ribosome is a cell organelle. Now we are asked to find the what the function of ribosome. Now ribosome are minute. They are minute particles consisting of minute particles consisting of RNA, that's the ribonucleic acid, and associated proteins. And associated proteins. Now these associated proteins are often enzymes. We call these enzymes the ribosomes, associated proteins that function towards synthesize proteins. That is, the RNA and these associated proteins in the ribosome function to synthesize what? To synthesize protein. That is, they are responsible for protein synthesis. Therefore, ribosome functions for what? Protein synthesis. And that is option B. Due to the what the RNA and associated protein, it is what it contains. So the function of ribosome is for protein synthesis. Now the part of the cell responsible for for reproduction is the centrioles, that is cell division, the centrioles. Then for respiration is the mitochondria. Mitochondria is responsible for respiration, and then for secretion of hormones, you can see the Golgi bodies or Golgi apparatus. And the secretory granules, secretion of hormones, Golgi apparatus, and also the secretory, the secretory vesicles. Secretory vesicles are also responsible for secretion of hormones. The Golgi apparatus actually helps to package these hormones and distribute them. Then the secretory vesicles what secrete these hormones. Then for excretion, you can see even the cell membrane here. Yeah. The cell membrane and some organisms actually helps in what in removal of what of unwanted substances as excretion but the part responsible for protein synthesis is the ribosome the ribosome so ribosome is responsible for what protein synthesis and that is option b thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos
Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Echo 2019 Biology Pass question, question 25. The thoracic vertebra is located in the A. Abdomen, B. Chest, C. Neck, D. Tail, and E. Waist. We are asked about the thoracic vertebra, that is, where is it located? Now, the vertebra is actually what we call the backbone. We call it the backbone and it's mostly found in vertebrates like man for instance we have this vertebra and these vertebra are actually divided into what into five we have the cervical vertebra we have the thoracic vertebra we have the lumbar vertebra the sacral vertebra and the cosigial vertebra now each of these vertebra has its own specific location Option A here says abdomen. Now, abdomen is actually the location for the lumbar vertebra. So, the lumbar vertebra is located in the, what? In the abdomen. Now, B says chest. Chest is actually what the location for the thoracic vertebra. Chest. Now, C says neck. Neck is the location for the cervical vertebra. D says tail. Tail is the location for the what? Cosigial. And then E says waist. Waste is the location for the sacral vertebra. So the answer to this question, which is the location of thoracic vertebra, is actually the chest. The thoracic vertebra is located in the chest. And this thoracic vertebra provides attachments for the for the ribs. For the ribs. So it's located in the chest region. Thank you and God bless you. And please subscribe to our channel for more videos and for more past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Echo 2019 Biology Pass Question 26. Which of the following is not an exoskeletal material? A. Chitin, B. Hoof, C. Nail, D. Scapula, and E. Scale. Which of the following is not an exoskeletal material? Now, exoskeletal material. Exoskeletal material are non living materials they are non-living materials which forms on the outside of organism on the outside of organisms now let's uh, look at these options now a says chitin now like you know chitin is found on the outside of the word arthropods that is the insects you find chitin on the outside of insects this chitin helps to protect these insects then B says hoof you find this hoof on the legs or the foot of cattle farm animals like the cattle the sheep the goats you find this hoof the horses you find the hoof there and you know that you will notice that they are non-living what materials and they are actually located on the outside this outside is very important that's where this exo is coming from so they are found on the outside of the organism, but it actually what helps to protect this organism because that is a function of skeleton. The skeletal system helps to, what, to protect. Then C says nail. You find this nail in man also. You find it on the outside of man. It's also what helps to protect man. Then option D says scapula. Now scapula is a bone. Scapula is a bone. You find it mostly like it is more prominent on the posterior aspects of the back of the body that's posterior aspects of the body you'll find this scapula so it's a bone and this scapula is what is an endoskeletal material it's an endoskeletal material because bones are what are endoskeletons because you find scapula inside the body not outside the body Scapula is located inside the body where muscles provide attachment for muscles and also for what for movement. So it's an endoskeletal material, not an exoskeletal material. Take notes. Then the scale here is an exoskeletal material found on the body of fish. On the body of fishes. You find scale on the body of fishes and also on lizard also. And lizard you find the skills so all these are what all these are exoskeletal material 
except scapula. Scapula is an endo or skeleton because it is a bone and bones are located inside the body. So scapula is not an exoskeletal material. So the answer to this question is option D. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass Question 27. The rib cage in mammal is made up of the ribs and the A clavicle, B humerus, C patella, D scapula, and E sternum. Now, the question is the rib cage in mammal is made up of the ribs and the. Now, the rib cage is located in the chest region. We call it the thorax. It's called the thorax as the chest region. And it's help protects it help protects delicate organs in this region. These organs include the hearts majorly and the two lungs, that's the right and the left lungs. So the rib cage helps to protect these hearts and the lungs. Now the rib cage is composed of the ribs and these ribs are actually attached to the vertebral bones and then also the sternum or what is referred to as the breastplate the breastplate so this sternum actually provides attachment for the ribs in in the front part of the what, of the chest region why the vertebral bones provide attachment for the ribs in the posterior parts of the body. So the rib cage is made up of the ribs and the sternum or the breastbone. And the sternum is actually option E. Now the clavicle here just provides attachment for the for the scapula. That is it attaches the scapula to the to the body. Then the humerus here is the bone of the arm. The bone of the arm. The patella is the kneecap the kneecap and the scapula here is the shoulder blade the shoulder blade you can call this clavicle the collarbone also known as the collarbone but the sternum and the ribs make up the rib cage that helps protect what the heart and the lungs so option e is the answer to this question thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to the channel for more videos and welcome i'll be answering neko 2019 biology pass question 28 the joint that allows movement in all direction is a ball and socket joint b gliding and sliding joint c hinge joint d pivot and e suture joint now the ball and socket joint is actually a type of joint it's a synovial joint we call them synovial joints because of the presence of synovial fluids and synovial membrane the synovial joint that allows movement allows movement in all direction <coughs> in all direction so it allows movement in all direction example of the ball and socket joint is the shoulder joint or the hip joint. and if you can see you can move your your arm in what's in different directions this is because of the presence of the ball and socket joint. now option b says gliding and sliding joints now gliding and sliding joints occurs between surfaces of two flat bones that is occurs between surfaces of two flat bones that are held together by ligaments held together by ligaments such that then example is the wrist joint or the ankle joint the wrist joint or the ankle joint so these two flat bones the surfaces are actually held together by what by ligaments so they are able to slide over with each other and that is why we call it gliding and sliding joints you find this in the wrist and in the ankle now c is hinge joints now hinge joint is also a synovial joint that allows it allows movements in only one plane that is in only one direction in only one 
direction and that is flexion and extension an example of this hinge joint is the elbow and knee joint the elbow and knee joint is a um, typical example of the hinge joints now the pivot joint the pivot joint is also a synovial joint that in which the ends of two bones the ends of two bones meet now in such a way that one end of this bone form a central bony cylinder and the other end form a ring so we call it a pivot joint like it one end of the bone take for instance one end of the bone like this form a what a central cylinder and then the other bone forms a what form something like a ring like this so we call it what a pivot joint and an example where you can find this pivot joint is in the neck the neck is a typical example where this pivot joint can be found that joint of the neck now option e says suture now this suture bones is only found in the skull the joint of the in the skull is the suture bone whereby the bones of the skull are actually attached together by fibers they are attached by fibers so they form the what the suture joints so it's only found in the skull now from the question the question says the joints that allows movements in all direction is a bone and socket joints like i said i said bone and socket joints is a synovial joint that allows movements in all direction and that is an example is the shoulder joints and the hip joints so option a is the answer to this question thank you and ensure to subscribe to our channel for more videos and for more past questions Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Neco 2019 Biology Pass Question 29. Which of the following enzymes act in the mouth? A. Lipase, B. Pepsin, C. Thialine, D. Renin, and E. Trypsin. Now, first of all, what are enzymes? Enzymes are organic catalysts, or you can call them biological catalysts that speed up the rate of chemical reactions in the body so you can actually say the speed up the rate of what metabolism chemical reaction in the body now each of these enzymes has its own what location that is its particular parts where they are actually located and they are actually secreted by different organs option a here says lipase now lipase is an enzyme that acts on fats and it's actually found you find this lipase actually in the intestine that is a small intestine that is where this lipase is found now pepsin is an enzyme that acts on protein and you find pepsin in the stomach now enzyme thialine is an enzyme that acts on cooked carbohydrates and you find this enzyme thialine in the salivary gland present in the words in the mouth now renin is an enzyme that acts on proteins in milk and this enzyme renin is actually found in babies mostly in babies and you find this enzyme in the stomach an enzyme trypsin is also an enzyme that acts on proteins it is actually released by the duodenum but you find it most especially in the small intestine or in the duodenum also the duodenal part of the small intestine so the question says which of the following enzyme acts in the mouth and from these options here and the analysis I've made enzyme thialine is the only enzyme that is found in the mouth and like I said this enzyme acts on cooked carbohydrates cooked carbohydrates so enzyme thialine is found in the mouth and it is secreted with the saliva so the answer to this question is actually option C thialine Thank you and God bless you. And subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Past Question 30. Which of the following animals is not a fluid feeder? A. Butterfly. C. Green fly. B. Green fly. C. Mosquito. D. Tick and E. Grasshopper. So the question is which of the following animals is not a fluid feeder. Now fluid feeder are simply organisms or animals that flee. They feed on fluid like materials.
fluid like materials that's for their essential words nutrients for essential nutrients now option a says butterfly butterfly is a fluid feeder because what it sucks the net nectar present in flowers you notice that butterfly are always found near in flowering plants this is because they feed on the nectar of these flowering plants likewise the green fly also the green fly also is a fluid feeder the green fly is a fluid feeder likewise the mosquito mosquito is also a, a fluid feeder because they feed on what's blood tick also is a fluid feeder it also feeds on blood of what of animals now e option e says grasshopper grasshopper is not a fluid feeder because grasshopper feeds on the leaves of plants it feeds on the leaves of plants so it is not a fluid feeder therefore the answer to this question is actually option e grasshopper grasshopper is not a fluid feeder thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering the 2019 Biology Pass question 31. The enzyme that converts protein to peptone is A. Amylase, B. Erepsin, C. Lipase, D. Pepsin, and E. Renin. So we are asked for the enzyme that converts protein to peptone. Now these peptones are polypeptides. Polypeptides. Like we know, enzyme are organic catalysts that have to speed up what's chemical reaction that is they have to speed up metabolic processes in the body. Now, option A says amylase. Amylase is an enzyme. Or you can say amylase are enzymes, yes, because amylase is usually referred to as group of enzymes that act on carbohydrates. So amylase is a general name for the group of enzymes that act on carbohydrate food. That's for amylase. So therefore, it's those they do not act on protein. Now, this is erepsin. Now, erepsin is an enzyme that is located in the duodenum. You find this in the small intestine, the duodenum, and it helps to what convert. It helps to convert proteins to polypeptides. That is the proteins that were not acted upon by pepsin in the stomach. Now C says lipase. Lipase is an enzyme that converts fats, fats and oil. It's what it acts on fats and oil. That is lipase. So lipase acts on fats and oil to give fatty acids and glycerol now pepsin pepsin is the first protein enzyme that is, is the first enzyme located in the stomach that acts pepsin that acts on protein it converts these proteins to peptones which are also what polypeptides now option e says renin renin is also a what is an enzyme located in the stomach that acts on milk protein it acts on milk protein now the question says the enzyme that converts proteins to peptones is now if you look at these options that i just described you see that what b here says erepsin which acts on proteins and option d here says what pepsin which also acts on what proteins but now the most correct answer to this question is actually what pepsin the correct answer is pepsin because what pepsin acts is the first enzyme that acts on what the proteins as they go into the stomach you know the food in the stomach will spend some hours and then this enzyme protein pepsin will act on this protein and convert them to what to peptones or polypeptides then those that are not acted upon by this sort of enzyme pepsin will now go into the small intestine and be acted upon by erepsin so the main enzyme that converts protein to peptone is actually what enzyme pepsin which is option d so option d is the correct answer to this question thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to the channel for more videos
Hello, good day, and welcome. Today, I'm going to be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass Question 32. The dental formula that is I, the incisor is equal to 3 over 3, C, the canine is equal to 1 over 1, P, premolar is equal to 4 over 4, and M, molar is equal to 2 over 3, then everything together to give 42, that is 42 tooth, represents that of A, dog, B, goat, C, man, D, rabbit, and E, sheep. So we are, we are asked to, rep to ascertain the animal that possesses this dental formula. Now, like we know, dental formula, dental formula shows the number. Dental formula shows the number and types of teeth. Dental formula shows the number and type of teeth an animal has in one half of each jaw so meaning that data formula represents what the number of teeth an animal has in one and a half of each jaw that is both upper and lower jaw now the ones in the numerator represent the upper jaw and the denominator represent the lower jaw now let's briefly what establish the dental formula of the following animals now option A yes is dog. Now the dental formula for dog, you have the incisor to be three over three, <coughs> the canine to be one over one, the premolar to be four over four, and then the molar to be three over three. Now this is for what for dog. So alt the molar to be two over three, sorry. Two over three. That's the molar that is two molar in the upper jaw and three molar in the lower jaw remember it is what one half of each jaw so all together <coughs> when you carry out this sum or the arithmetic it will give you 42 then option b option d and option e are all herbivores remember dog is a carnivore yeah. and carnivores have the same dental formula but goats rabbits and sheep are herbivores and they have all the same dental formula so for option b d and e they have the same formula that is for the goat rabbit and sheep the incisor i is equal to two over one that means two in the upper jaw one in the lower jaw that's the half of the upper jaw and lower jaw then c the canine is zero over zero meaning that they have no canine then p is equal to the premolar is equal to three over two so in one half of the upper jaw they have three premolar and in one half of the lower jaw they have two premolar and then m molar is equal to three over three that is in the one half of the upper jaw they have three molar and in the one half of the lower jaw they have three molar then option c which is man c which is man is giving us i which is the incisor two over two c K9 1 over 1, P premolar 2 over 2, and M molar 3 over 3. Now, from this, you will see that the animal with this dental formula is actually what option A dog. Like you can see, dog has three incisor on one half of the upper jaw, and likewise on one half of the lower jaw, one K9 on the one half of the upper jaw, and the same with the one half of the lower jaw, four premolar. On one half of the upper jaw and likewise one half of the lower jaw and then two molar in one half of the upper jaw and three molar in one half of the lower jaw so therefore the answer to this question is actually what a dog dog is the animal with this dental formula that is carnivores with this dental formula thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass Question 33. The function of blood platelets is to A. Distribute heat throughout the body, B. Fight pathogenic microorganisms, C. Help in clotting of blood, D. Produce antibodies, and E. Transport oxygen around the body. Now, the blood platelets is part of the blood cells. It's part of the blood cells. Remember, we have three blood cells. We have the blood platelets. 
the blood platelets we have the red blood cell and we have the white blood cell then we also have what the liquid components of the blood which is the, what the blood plasma so these are the composition of the blood now we are asked for the function of the blood platelets the blood platelets is responsible the blood platelets is responsible for what for the clotting of blood responsible for the clotting of blood that is whenever there is a break in the what continuity of the skin whenever there is injury it is this blood and um, blood platelets that initiates or is responsible for the clotting this clotting simply means what the closing of the injured part that is to prevent what to stop or prevent bleeding that is the action of the blood platelets now option a says distribute heat throughout the body this is not the function of the blood platelets this is actually the function of what the blood plasma because the blood plasma is a liquid portion of the blood now b says fight pathogenic microorganism now this is the function of the what the white blood cell this is the function of the white blood cell c says help in clotting yes this is the function of the blood platelets and this is produce antibody this is the function of the white blood cell also the white blood cells are responsible for defense mechanism of the body then option e says transport oxygen around the body now this is the function of the red blood cell the red blood cell is concerned with the transport of what respiratory gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide due to the presence of what hemoglobin so the function of blood platelets is what help in clotting of blood and that is option c Thank you and ensure you subscribe to the channel for more videos and for more past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Past Question 34. Transpiration pool is the A. Flow of mineral salts from soil to plant roots. B. Flow of water from roots to leaves of plants. C. Movement of water across plant roots. D. Pressure of water on plant roots. And E. Transportation of water from leaves to roots. Now, transpiration pool. Transpiration pool is the flow of water from the roots through the xylem vessels, that is the vessel responsible for the conduction of water which is xylem vessel to the cells of the leaf to the cells of the leaves and like we know transpiration here on its own simply means what the movement or the escape of water from leaves that is tomata of leaf in form of water vapor to the environment now transpiration pool is just like a force that actually what moves water that is the flow of water from the roots remember the roots conduct towards water from the soil now the flow of water from this roots through the xylem vessels which is the vessel responsible for the conduction of water and salt to the leaves is what we refer to as what transpiration pool so after this water has been what moved to the cells of the leaves evaporation will then occur evaporation occurs and then the water diffuses out of the plants as vapor through the stomata so transpiration pool is what simply involves the flow of water from the roots to the leaves of plants for what transpiration to occur. So option B is the right answer to this question. Flow of water from the roots to the leaves of plants. That is transpiration pool. Thank you and God bless you. And should subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass question, te question 35. The main function of blood plasma is to A. Carry up dissolved oxygen around the body, B. Fight pathogenic microorganisms, C. Form parts of blood, D. Help in production of bone marrow, and E. Transports dissolved substance. Now, the blood. The blood is made up of the liquid parts which is known as the blood plasma and the what the solid parts that's the cell the blood cells which include the red blood cell the white blood cell and the what and the platelets now each of these components of the blood has their specific function 
Now the blood plasma. The blood plasma is a liquid portion of the blood. Blood plasma is a liquid portion of the blood. Its main function. Its main function is to transport. <coughs> is to transport all dissolved substances or materials. All dissolved substances or materials such as nutrients, the wastes, hormones, plasma proteins and so on. So the function of the blood plasma is basically for, for transport of dissolved substances in it because it is the liquid portion of the blood. Now option A says carry dissolved oxygen around the body. Now this is the function of the red blood cell. The red blood cells are responsible for what? the transport of oxygen due to the presence of hemoglobin. B says fight pathogenic microorganisms. This is the function of the white blood cells. White blood cells are concerned with defense mechanism of the body. C says forms part of the blood. Yes, it's part of the blood, but that is not the main function. And D says help in production of bone marrow. No. And E says transport of dissolved substances. Yes, this is the main function of the blood plasma. Transport dissolved substances ranging from the nutrients, the waste, and other substances. Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I'll be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass question 36. The thoracic cavity is separated from the abdomen, cavi abdominal cavity, by a diaphragm, b epiglottis, c intercostal muscle, d pleural membrane, and e pyloric sphincter. Now, the thoracic cavity, the thoracic cavity, thoracic cavity is the chest region. That's the region consisting of the ribs and the sternum, that's the breastbone. Then the abdominal cavity. Abdominal cavity is the abdomen. That's the place or the parts containing our viscerals. That is the stomach, the liver, your intestine. That is the abdominal cavity. Now this thoracic cavity contains the heart and the lungs. But it is separated from this abdominal cavity by a muscle. It is separated by a muscle known as the diaphragm. Known as the diaphragm. Now let me just give a brief sketch. Let's take for instance. This is the thoracic cavity with the ribs. This is the sternum. With the ribs like this is the sternum. Now the diaphragm is a muscle like this. This is the diaphragm. Separating this thoracic cavity here, let's say this is the thoracic cavity. Separating this thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. This is the abdominal cavity. So the diaphragm acts as a muscle. It's a muscle that, well, that stands between this thoracic cavity, that's the chest region, and the abdomen. So the answer to this question is option A, the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle. And it also assists in inspiration and expiration. It separates this word thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Now the epiglottis here. Epiglottis is found in the neck region. It's found in the neck region. The intercostal muscles. Those are the muscles that are that are between the ribs. The muscles. These muscles are between ribs. Then the pleural membrane is the membrane that covers the lungs. And the pyloric sphincter is a sphincter present in the pylorus of the stomach. You'll find it in the pylorus of the stomach. That is where the stomach become, um, enters into the duodenum. So the answer to this question is the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from abdominal cavity. Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Echo 2019 Biology Pass Question 37. Breathing in animals, in mammals, is accompanied by regular movement of diaphragm and 
A. Clavicle B. Intercostal muscle C. Pleural cavity D. The scapula and E. Vertebral column Now breathing simply involves the words the taking in and out of air from the atmosphere that's breathing now breathing are actually what accompanied by the movement of some muscles that is some muscles are the one that brings about what these breathing activities in man and this involves the regular movement of the diaphragm the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles intercostal muscles these muscles assist we humans or mammals in breathing now the diaphragm is a muscle that is found between the thoracic cavity you'll find the diaphragm between the thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity during inspiration the diaphragm flattens to allow what, the lungs to occupy more air and during expiration the diaphragm what, returns to its normal shape its dome shape so that what it can push out air out of the lungs that's during expiration likewise the intercostal muscles also the intercostal muscles are we have the external intercostal muscle the external intercostal muscle we have the internal intercostal muscle and then we have the words transverse m um, and the other these are the main intercostal muscles now this intercostal muscles also contract and relaxes during what during inspiration and expiration so breathing in mammals is actually accompanied by the words regular movement of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and that is option b so option b is the answer to this question clavicle here is a bone that is we call it the collar bone the pleural cavity is the cavity occupied by, by the, the lungs, lungs. The, the scapula, scapula is, is a bone also known as the shoulder blade, blade. We call it the shoulder blade, blade. And, and the vertebral, vertebral column is the vertebral bones. bones. The vertebral bones. So the answer to this question is option B, intercostal muscle. Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 38. The tiny respiratory openings in the abdomen of an insect is called A. The alveola, B. The spiracles, C. Trachea, D. Tracheals, and E. Valves. So we are asked for the tiny respiratory openings in an abdomen. Now, the tiny respiratory openings in an abdomen is called the tracheals. They are called the tracheals. Tracheus is the tiny respiratory openings in the abdomen of an insect. Let's take for instance, this is the abdomen of an insect. Let's take for instance, this is the abdomen of an insect. Now, you will find what tiny openings like this in the abdomen of this insect. Now, this openings is referred to as the tracheus. Now, how do these tracheus operate? Air enters into the insect, that is, air enters the insect. Or the insect breathing air the insects through the spiracles so air enters into the insect through the spiracles then from the spiracles the air goes into the trachea so the trachea is actually the what, respiratory what, system of an insect into the trachea then from the trachea the air then diffuses the air diffuses into the tiny tracheus into the tracheus into the tracheus within the body cells that is within the abdomen within the body cells so now from this tracheus the air then what goes back into the what into the surrounding so that is how it operates so the tiny openings respiratory openings in the abdomen of an insect are the tracheus and that is option d like I said, I say air enters through the spiracles. It enters through the spiracles, then goes into the trachea of the insects, and then diffuses into the tracheals ends within the cell bodies or the body cells, and then goes into the what into the environments. The alveolar here is a respiratory what's op um, opening or a respiratory 
organ present in the lungs you find the alveoli in the lungs and these valves here valves are actually found in the heart you find valves in the heart and blood vessels blood vessels valves helps to prevent the back flow of blood why alveolar helps in gaseous exchange present in the lungs but the spiracles the trachea and the tracheus are concerned with insects these are concerned with insects but then the tracheus is the respiratory opening in the abdomen of an insect and that is option d so option d is the correct answer to this question thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, Hello, good day, day and, and welcome. welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 39. Which of the following is a droop? A. Mango B. Orange C. Purple D. Pineapple E. Tomato So we are asked for an option that is a fruit which is classified as a droop. Now, a droop is a true a drupe is a true simple fruit with a well developed pericarp with a well developed pericarp <coughs> now a drupe has its epicarp to be thin and forms the skin and forms the skin its mesocarp is fleshy or fibrous is fleshy or fibrous and then its endocarp is usually hard and woody it's hard and woody and encloses seed and enclose seed now from this description of a droop you agree with me that mango here is a droop because if you look at the characteristics of a droop its epicarp is thin and forms the skin so also the mango the epicarp of mango forms the skin and it's also thin now the mesocarp is fleshy or fibrous the mesocarp of mango is actually what fleshy and then the endocarp is hard and woody and encloses the seed and that is correct for mango very correct so a mango is a droop now option b here says orange now orange is not a droop orange is a hesperidium we call it hesperidium purple and tomatoes are not droop also they are berry and then pineapple is a sorosis a sorosis is not a droop but the only droop here is mango because it has a well-developed pericarp in which the epicarp is thin and forms the skin its mesocarp is fleshy and its endocarp is hard and woody another example of a droop is the coconut coconut is another example of a droop so the answer to this question is option a mango thank you and ensure to subscribe to our channel for more videos and for more past questions hello good day and welcome i will be answering neco 2019 biology past question 40. the excretory organ of insects is a contractor vacuum b flame cell c malfigian tubule d nephridia and e urinary tubule so we are asked for the excretory organs of insects now excretory organs are organs that actually that enables an organism to remove unwanted materials from your body 
So that is the work or the function of excretory organs. Now, this is contractile vacuole. Contractile vacuole is the excretory organ of amoeba, or you can say protozoas. Then B says flame cell. Now, flame cell is the excretory organ for flatworms, like the tapeworm. Then C says malpighian tubule. Now, malpighian tubule is the excretory organ of insects. Insects like the grasshopper, can name them the cockroach, and so on. Then nephridia is the excretory organ for earthworm. And urinary tubule is the excretory organ for humans or mammals, higher animals. So the excretory organ of insects is malpighian tubule, and that is option C. Thank you and God bless you. And subscribe to the channel for more videos and for more past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 41. The organelle that removes excess water from the body of a protozoan is A. Cell wall, B. Contractile vacuole, C. Nucleus, D. Plasma membrane, and E. Protoplasm. Now, protozoan. Example of a protozoa is the amoeba. Now, these protozoa are mostly found in fresh water. They are mostly found in fresh water and due to the hypotonic contents of these protozoans or of the amoeba this fresh water tends to enters enter into the protozoa so the fresh water goes into the protozoa through its cell membrane because the cell membrane is permeable through its cell membrane now when there's excess water or excess water contents in the protozoa that is take for instance the amoeba the contractile vacuole now which is the excretory organ of the protozoa or the amoeba the contractile vacuole then remove this excess water this excess water and empties the contents into the exterior so it is the function of the contractile vacuole towards to remove excess water from the body of a protozoan. And like I told you, a typical example is the amoeba. And this is because they are mostly found in fresh water. And because the contents of this amoeba are hypotonic, fresh water tends to move in towards into the cells. And to prevent what excess water in the cells or the body of this amoeba, the contractile vacuole, which is the excretory organ of the protozoa, tends to remove this excess water into the what into the exterior, that's into the environment. So, contractile vacuole is the organelle that removes excess water from the body of a protozoan, and that is option B. Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 42. The following factors affect organisms in aquatic habitats except A. Humidity, B. Light, C. Temperature, D. Turbidity, and E. Water current. So, we have to pick an option which do not affect organisms in aquatic habitats. Now, for us to pick this option, we have to what, simply check out the meaning of the following factors. Now, humidity. Humidity simply refers to the measure the measure of moisture in the atmosphere measure of moisture in the atmosphere that's humidity now light actually light just simply means what light simply means the entrance of sun rays that's in a water body so how does this entrance of what sun rays or en entrance of the sunlight work in this aquatic habitat? Then 
see here temperature temperature is defined as the measure of a degree of hotness hotness or coldness of an environment now turbidity turbidity is actually caused by the presence of presence of suspended matter such that the entrance of light the entrance of light is affected so that's turbidity then E says water current now water current just simply refers to the activities in the water that is water currents are usually common in aquatic ecosystem and they increase erosion and turbidity so it just was simply like let me say the water wave the water wave that's what water current simply represents now the fa the following factors affect aquatic organism in, ha in aquatic um, affect organism in aquatic habitat except now you say that option b says light now light affects what affect organism and aquatic habitat because penetration of light into the aquatic habitat will enable the plant the foods of these aquatic organisms take for instance the phytoplankton phytoplankton are micro plants and these aquatic organisms like fish feed on these phytoplankton and these plants these my uh, phytoplankton require light for what for production of food so therefore it affects the aquatic organism so lights affect aquatic organism now temperature temperature also affects aquatic organisms because when the temperature is too high in the aquatic habitats the organisms was be are unable to bear this temperature and some might even die so temperature is very important also turbidity I told you that turbidity deals with what it affects the penetration of light that is the entrance of light into water body this is due to the what presence of suspended matter so turbidity is actually a factor that affects aquatic organism, organisms now water currents also affect aquatic organisms because more the increased water currents the more the aeration of the water and like you know aquatic organism actually gets their oxygen from this water so water current helps to increase aeration but now option a here says humidity and humidity is a measure of moisture in the atmosphere atmosphere has nothing to do with what with aquatic habitats it is only terrestrial habitats that is affected by what by humidity so humidity do not affect aquatic organisms and so therefore the answer to this question is actually what humidity which is option a Thank you and God bless you. Just subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 43. Which of the following describes the place an organism live? A. Biome B. Community C. Ecology D. Habitat and E niche so let's briefly describe these options to get our answer now biome a large natural terrestrial ecosystem they are large natural te terrestrial ecosystem natural terrestrial ecosystem then community community is made up of all populations all the populations of living organism that exist together in a habitat that exist together in a habitat ecology ecology is a study of the relationship between organisms and their environment then option this is habitat now habitat is simply described as a place where an organism 
leaves that's an habitat then a niche or ecological niche is a particular or the particular position the particular position occupied by an organism and its function in a habitat so the question says which of the following describes the place an organism lives now the place an organism lives is simply refers to what a habitat like we have established and that is option d i say habitat is a place where an organism lives or a place where an organism can be found so the answer to this question is option d habitats thank you and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and for more past questions Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Past Question 44. Changes in energy flow between organisms in a habitat can be represented by A. Food chain, B. Food web, C. Pyramid of biomass, D. Pyramid of energy, and E. Pyramid of numbers. Now, let's check each of these options before we can ascertain which represents or which represents will be represented by changes in energy flow between organisms in the habitat now option a says food chain now food chain shows the transfer of energy and nutrients from organism from one organism to another so this simply shows the transfer of energy and nutrients of energy and nutrients from one organism To another that is food chain now food chain can be represented as this take for instance you have a grass then let's take for instance maybe goats we feed on this grass and then lion we feed on the goats now this is about a food chain this is a food chain you can see the transfer of energy and nutrients from one what organism to another now b says food web now food web in an ecosystem simply represents what it represents numerous words food chain that is how food chains are linked together how numerous food chains can be linked that is what that is a food web food web comprises of different food chain different food chain now c says pyramid of biomass pyramid of biomass represent the total weight or dry mass of the organism in each trophic level it represents the total dry or wet mass of an organism in each trophic level in each trophic level now like you know trophic level simply represents what that is each level of this organism in the food chain now pyramid of energy pyramid of energy actually represents the rates of flow of food energy through each trophic level it represents the rates of flow of energy through each trophic level in a food chain so pyramid of energy is mainly concerned with what with the rate of flow of energy that is the changes what concerning the rate of flow of energy in a food chain now pyramid of number pyramid of number simply represents the number of individuals at each trophic level it represents number of individuals at each trophic level at each trophic level now let's go back to the question the question says changes in energy flow between organisms in a habitat can be represented by now like i told you i say food change or simply refers to the what the transfer of energy and nutrients from one organism to another now pyramid of energy which represents the rates at which what 
energy flows from one organism to another is actually what represented as this that is pyramid of energy can also be seen to rep what represent the changes in energy flow between organism in a habitat that is how this word flow of energy changes from one trophic level to another from one trophic level to another that is from the producer how the energy was flow changes from the producer then down to the what to the primary consumer down to the secondary consumer getting to the what to the tertiary consumer so this is actually represented by what by the pyramid of energy it is concerned with the rate of flow of energy in the food chain so therefore the answer to this question is actually what option d pyramid of energy thank you and god bless you and subscribe to our channel for more videos and for more past questions Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 45. An example of poikilotemic animal organism is A. Bird, B. Cat, C. Dog, D. Frog, and E. Rat. So the question is, which of these is an example of poikilotemic organism? Now, poikilotemic organism simply refers to as cold-blooded organisms cold-blooded organisms that is organism that is cold-blooded then the opposite of poikilotemic is poimoitemic organisms now these organisms are warm-blooded organisms warm-blooded now option a says bed mostly poikilotemic organisms are actually organisms that lives in what that lives in aquatic habitats mostly they live in aquatic habitat why these homothermic organisms are organisms that what that live on the land that's terrestrial habitats or the arboreal habitats now bed is an organism that lives what in the terrestrial habitat or the arboreal habitats and so therefore it's a warm-blooded animal so bed is a warm-blooded animal it is not peculothermic same with cats Cats is a homogenic animal because it lives in a terrestrial habitat, so it is not poikilotemic. C says dog. Dog is also what a homogenic animal. It is not poikilotemic. Option E says rat. Rat is also what a terrestrial organism, so it is not poikilotemic. Now option D says frog, and like you know, a frog lives on both aquatic and terrestrial habitats, but mostly they live in what aquatic habitats. And so, therefore, frogs are poikilotemic animals. They are poikilotemic organisms. That is, they are cold-blooded organisms. Another example of a cold-blooded organism is the fish. Fish is also cold-blooded. So, the answer to this question is option D, frog. Thank you, and ensure to subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 46. The plant hormone that stimulates cell elongation is known as A. Abscisic Acid, B. Auxins, C. Ethylene, D. Gibberellins, and E. Cytokinins. So we are asked to pick an option which is a plant hormone that stimulates cell elongation. Now let's check out the importance or the use of these hormones. A says abscisic acid. Now abscisic acid is a growth inhibitor. Abscisic acid is a growth inhibitor. Meaning that it inhibits growth and so therefore will not stimulate cell elongation. And it also plays role in abs abscission. It plays role in abscission. Abscission simply means what? The falling of three parts. It's like, for instance, the falling of leaves is abscission, falling of fruits also abscission, that is after aging. So, abscisic acid actually what stimulates aging and abscission and suppresses what the growth of buds. Now, B here says auxin. Now, auxin is one of the most important plant hormones, one of the most important plant hormones that promotes what the normal stem growth in plants by stimulating by stimulating 
cell elongation. Now, how does this auxin stimulate cell elongation? Auxin does this by softening the cell wall, thereby making it possible for the cell to stretch as their protoplasm swells and increase in amount. So, when the auxin, the auxin goes to sweat to soften the cell wall. As it softens the cell wall, the cell wall is no longer rigid. It now makes it possible for this cell to stretch. A stretch. They stretch as a result of their prot pro protoplasm swells, their protoplasm swells and also increase in amount. So that is what brings about what the cell elongation which is produced by auxin. Now option C says ethylene. Ethylene is another plant hormone that hastens the ripening of fruits. It hastens the ripening of fruits and also retard lateral board development. It's retard lateral board development. Now gibberellin is also a plant hormone that stimulates cell elongation along with auxin along with auxin now if you can see you see that gibberellin is here and auxins actually stimulate cell elongation but the most important or the one most concerned with cell elongation is the auxin auxin is the most important hormone responsible for what cell elongation because it acts on the cell wall softening the cell wall and making it possible for the protoplasm to swell and increase in amount, thereby leading to stretching of the cell, bringing about the what the cell elongation. Gibberellin also brings about cell elongation and division, but it is not the most important actually. The one, the hormone that is most concerned with this activity is the auxin. Cytokinin, which is option E, is also an o hormone that promotes plant growth. It's a growth promoting hormone, so it promotes plants growth and this hormone is actually produced in the roots so the answer to this question is actually option b auxin so whenever you see this kind of question where you are asked for the hormone that stimulates the elongation and auxin and gibberellin is given to you in the options the most correct answer is actually auxin because it is the one that is mostly associated with cell elongation thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I'll be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 47. The hormone that stimulates the reabsorption of water from kidney tubules is A. Adrenocorticotropic hormone B. Antidiuretic hormone C. Gonadotropin hormone D. Oxytocin and E. Prolactin So we are asked to pick an option which is a hormone that is responsible for the reabsorption of water from the kidney tubule. Now A says adrenocorticotropic hormone now adrenocorticotropic hormone is hormone secreted by the pituitary gland that stimulates the adrenal cortex to produce its hormone so its function is just to stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce its hormones now the hormones of the adrenal cortex are called the corticosteroids So this is the function of adrenocorticotropic hormone. Now option B says antidiuretic hormone. Now antidiuretic hormone is also known as ADH. It's actually produced by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus produces this hormone, but then the hormone is stored in the pituitary gland. That is the posterior part of the pituitary gland. And then this hormone is responsible for the reabsorption absorption of water from kidney tubules from the name antidiuretic you will know that that is the function of this hormone the absorption of water from kidney tubules kidney tubules now option c is gonadotropin hormone now this gonadotropin hormone include the fsh that's the follicle stimulating hormone and the lh the luteinizing hormone these two hormones are concerned with the maturation and the release of gonads. Now, option D says oxytocin. Oxytocin is also a hormone of the 
pituitary gland that induces childbirth or labor. It induces childbirth and also induces milk secretion from the nipple. Then option E says prolactin. Prolactin induces milk production. So now from all I have described, you agree with me that option B, antidiuretic hormone, ADH, is the answer to this question because it is one concerned with the reabsorption of water from the kidney tubules. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 48. Adrenal gland in man is situated above the A. Brain, B. Heart, C. Kidney, D. Pancreas, and E. Stomach. Now, the adrenal gland, the adrenal gland is also known as the suprarenal gland. Is known as the suprarenal gland, and this name is divided into the supra and the renal. Supra here meaning above, and renal here meaning kidney. So, in other words, the adrenal gland simply means what it is above the kidney. Now, it is represented this way. Let's take for instance, we have the kidney, this is the kidney, then we have the suprarenal, suprarenal gland or the adrenal gland on the kidney, kidney like this. this. Now, now this, this is, is the adrenal gland. So, so in man, the adrenal, adrenal gland is located above the kidney. kidney. And, and that, that is option C, above the kidney. kidney. Thank, Thank you, you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 49. The diagram represents the mammalian A, E, B, I, C, nose, the skin, and E tongue. Now, looking at this diagram, you see that this diagram actually represents the mammalian represents the mammalian tongue. This diagram represents the mammalian tongue, and like we know, the mammalian tongue is responsible for the special sense of taste responsible for the special sense of taste that is the mammalian tongue is that organ in the body that enables us to taste so this diagram represents the diagram of the mammalian tongue and that is option E thank you and God bless you and subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, Hello good day and, and welcome. I'll be answering the Neko 2019 Biology Pass question 15. Sweet taste is felt in the past labeled I, 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 V, and V. Now, now this, this is the diagram. diagram. This diagram, diagram represents what the mammalian tongue. It represents the mammalian tongue. Now, this, this mammalian tongue is responsible for the special things, sense of taste special sense of taste so it's responsible for what? for the sense of taste and each segment of this tongue is what is specialized for a particular word particular taste now i hear that is this area behind here is for bitter taste Then I, I, that is close to the, the side, close to the back, is for sour taste. I, 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 that's the side in the front, is for salt taste. And then the tip of the tongue here, which is in front here, IV, is for sweet taste. So therefore, the answer to this question is option D. Ivy.
So switch this is failed in the plus labeled words IV and that is option D. Thank you and God bless you. Ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 51. Which of the following fruits disperses its seeds by explosive mechanism? A. Casalpinia, B. Combretum, C. Cotton, D. Desmodium, and E. Tridax. So, we are asked for the fruit that disperses its seed by explosive mechanism. Now, most of the fruit that disperses their seeds by explosive um, that disperses their seeds by explosive mechanism are dry dehiscent fruits. They are mostly dry dehiscent fruits. They disperses their seed via what this explosive mechanism. An explosive mechanism is a self-dispersal mechanism because it does not involve external agents. So, explosive mechanism you can see is a self dispersal mechanism because it does not involve what external agent intervention and this mechanism forcibly what eject the seeds and scatter them some distance away from the parent plant so it simply involves what it eject the seeds and then scatter these seeds scatter them some distance away from the parent plants from parent plants an example of the dry dehiscent fruits that disperses the seed via explosive mechanisms includes the acacia the casalpinia the balsam fruits and the oil bean the oil bean fruits and from our uh, options here, you see that option A is Casalpinia. So Casalpinia is a fruit that disperses its seeds by explosive mechanism. And that is the answer to this question. A, Casalpinia. Thank you and God bless you. And sure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 54. Estivation is a behavioral activity in A. Birds, B. Cats, C. Horses, D. Monkeys, and E. Insects. Now, estivation is a behavioral activity that is actually carried out by some organisms during the hot or hot dry season. Estivation is the opposite of hibernation. It is the opposite of hibernation. Hibernation is done during the cold season. But for estivation, the animals or organisms spend the hot dry season in a sleep like or torpid state. That is, these animals, what they go into a, what is sleep-like state or a torpid state. They become what inactive during this hot, hot, dry season. The animals would go into an what inactive state. That is estivation. It is opposite of hibernation. During hibernation, the animal goes into what into inactive state during cold season. But in estivation, it is during what hot, dry season. And estivation is mostly what a behavioral activities of insects snakes toads and rodents so they go into a sleep like what state or toby state or inactive state during hot dry season now from the options here we see that option e insect is part of the what the organisms i listed that undergoes estivation so the answer to this question is what insect in the insect is an animal or organism that undergo what estivation during hot dry season thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions
Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 55. The organism that plays dead as a defense strategy is A. Butterfly, B. Hawk, C. Opossum, D. Porcupine, and E. World Gecko. Now we're asked to pick an option that is an organism that plays dead as a defense strategy. Like we know, most animals actually have its own strategy by which it defends itself against predators. Now let's look at it. Let's look at each of these options. The organism that plays dead as a defense strategy is actually the opossum, which is option C. Now an opossum rolls over and plays dead. It rolls over and plays dead to escape its potential predator. And like you know, when an organism plays dead, the predators leaves the dead animal alone. Most predators, most predators do not want to feed on dead animals, so they leave the dead animal alone. And this is the, the defense strategy used by the opossum. The opossum, once it approaches its predator, it rolls over and plays dead in order to escape its own potential predator and predator. And so the predator looks at this opossum as a dead animal and then leaves it. But for the hawk, the hawk actually fights back. It fights using its beak and claws. This is the defense strategy of the hawk. It falls down on its back and will fight back using its beak and claws. Then for the porcupine, the porcupine uses its thorns as a defense mechanism. As defense mechanism. And then the wall gecko, wall gecko detaches parts of its body, most especially its tail. It detaches its tail. And by doing that, it deceives the predator. It deceives the predator. So when it detaches its tail, the predator would think maybe this wall gecko is already dead. But not knowing that it is actually the part of the um, wall gecko. That has been that has been detached, and then the wall gecko tends to escape. So this is a different strategy for the hawk, the porcupine, and the wall gecko. But the organism that plays dead as a defense strategy is actually opossum, which is option C. Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 56. The following are example of vestigial parts in man, except A. Appendix, B. Degenerated pelvic bone, C. External ears, D. Rudimentary tail, and E. Sparse body hair. So we are asked to pick an option which is not a vestigial part in man. Now, vestigial parts in man are simply body parts that has no specific function in man they have no specific function in man but in other organisms but in other organisms that's lower organisms this particular part has what has a great importance now I'll give you an example of this vestigial part in man an example of the vestigial part in man is the appendix. The appendix. Now, this appendix in man has no specific function, but in the herbivores, this appendix is represented as the what? As the cecum, or we call it the cecum in the herbivores, where what? Where digestion still occurs. Another example is the rudimentary tail in man. The rudimentary tail in man, that is the coccyx. Now, if you look at this rudimentary tail in man, in other animals, it is what? It forms the tail, and it is very important in other animals. But in terms of man now, it becomes what the rudimentary, that is the coccyx bone. Another example is the sparse body hair. The sparse body hair of man. In other animals, this sparse body hair forms the fore. In other animals. And another example is the external ear. 
If you look at the external ear of man, it is small compared to that of other animals. So these are what the vestigial parts in man. Now, looking at the options, option A says appendix, which is part of the vestigial parts. Option C says external ears, which is part. Rudimentary tail is part, and sparse body hair is part. But the only option here that is not an example of vestigial part in man is option B, which is degenerated pelvic bone. It is not a vestigial part in man, and that is the answer to this question. Thank you, and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 57. In a Mendelian cross between pea plants that are heterozygous for flower color, PP, that is heterozygous, with the what is the probability that the offspring will be homozygous recessive? So, A, we have 1 over 2, B, 1 over 4, D, C, one, 3 over 4, D, 2 over 2, and E, 4 over 4. Now, a Mendelian cross between pea plants that are heterozygous for flower color, PP. So we have the first heteros these first heterozygous plants crossed with the second heterozygous plants. Now, by crossing these plants for the first filial generation, we we'll have we we'll have this. So here we have the P, P that's homozygous for this flower color and then that's homozygous dominant for this flower color and heterozygous dominant for this flower color. Then we we'll also have we we'll also have P, P, that's heterozygous dominant for this flower, and then small p, small p, homozygous recessive for this flower. Now, looking at this, we have one homozygous dominant, which is this. We have two heterozygous dominant. Two heterozygous dominant, which is this and this. Then we have one heterozygous, one homozygous recessive. One homozygous recessive, which is this. Now the question says, what is the probability that the offspring will be homozygous recessive? Now out of these four outcome, just one is homozygous recessive. Therefore, the probability of homozygous recessive will be equals to 1 all over 4 and that is option B so the answer is option B 1 over 4 thank you and God bless you and just subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering NECO 2019 Biology Pass Question 58. An example of sex linked character is A. Color blindness, B. Fingerprint, C. Long sightedness, D. Mutation, and E. Short sightedness. Now, what are sex linked characters? Sex linked characters are characters determined by a gene located only on the X chromosome. So, their characters determined by a gene located on only the X chromosome and that's why we call it a sex link trait or sex link character because they are linked only to the what X chromosome now sex link characters it's not what's linked to the Y chromosome. Take note, it is not linked to the Y chromosome. It is only determined by the what? By a gene on the X chromosome. And that is why a sex link trait is actually gotten by from a son can only get a sex link trait from his 
mother from his mother now this is because being a boy or being a male you have the x y chromosome and this y chromosome is coming from the father and the x chromosome here is coming from the mother and since this sex link character or sex link traits are determined by gene on the x chromosome alone it simply means that sons can only inherit a sex link traits from its mother because it only receives its x chromosome from its mother And so, that is why on a mother can only what give a sex link trait to it, her son, not her daughter also. Now, for the female, they have the XX, while for the male, it is XY. So, even if the sex link trait is recessive, but because it is on this Y X chromosome, it will, what, it will manifest in the son. And that is why sex link traits are actually determined by this X chromosome. An example of this sex link trait includes the color blindness, color blindness, and hemophilia. Hemophilia. And from the option, you see that what we have color blindness given to us, which is option A. So color blindness is an example of a sex linked character or a sex link trait. So the answer to this question is option A color blindness thank you and god bless you and should subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions hello good day and welcome i will be answering neko 2019 biology past question 59 the diagram represents a axon b dendrite c neuron d reflex arc and e synapse now this diagram here simply represents the diagram of a neuron this is diagram of a neuron or a nerve cell now neuron or nerve cell is a structural and functional units functional units of the nervous system of the nervous system now this is a neuron option a says an axon now this is an axon this here this four here represents an axon option b says dendrites this one here is a dendrite all these are parts of the neuron the axon and the dendrites are parts of the neuron now e says synapse now synapse is formed when this neuron communicates with another neuron that is communicated to the synaptic cleft of another neuron then we say this is a what this is a synapse that point that junction where they communicate is known as a synapse then this is reflex arc arc reflex arc is just the pathway the pathway of a reflex action and i believe we know what reflex action are that is involuntary action that is not controlled by we that we, we don't control these actions example is an eject so the pathway of this reflex action is the reflex arc but this diagram here is the diagram of the word neuron or the nerve cell and that is option c thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Neko 2019 Biology Pass Question 60. The part responsible for transmitting impulses to the body to the cell body is labeled A, I, B, I, I, C, I, 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 D, I, V, and E, V. Like we know, this diagram represents the diagram of the neuron or a nerve cell, and it has several parts. I here represents the dendrites I, I here represent the nucleus as you can see the nucleus present in the cell body I, I, I here represent the myelin sheets the myelin sheets IV here represent the axon and V here represent the Schwann cell now each of these parts labeled has its own function the dendrite which is I is responsible for transmitting impulses to the cell body that is impulses received from another neuron 
are being carried to the cell body of a particular neuron by the word dendrites. So the dendrites transmit impulses. It transmits impulses to cell body. Now, I I here, which is the nucleus, like we know, the nucleus simply controls the activity of the nerve cell. Controls activity of nerve cell or neuron. Now, I I I is the myelin sheet, and the myelin sheet is responsible for what? For insulating, insulating the nerve fiber. That's the axon. Responsible for insulating the axon. Which is the nerve fiber and it also increases the, the speed of transmission now iv here is the axon the axon is responsible for transmitting impulses away from the cell body so axon transmits impulses transmits impulses away from cell body then schwann cell which is iv is the one that produces the myelin sheets produces myelin sheets now from the question the question says the part responsible for transmitting impulses to the cell body to and that is dendrite which is what option a i the dendrite is a nerve fiber that transmits what impulses to the cell body why the axon is a nerve fiber that transmits impulses away from the cell body so the answer to this question is option a dendrite Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions.